Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, and then from the book of Acts, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. And before we read, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, which we are about to read. We ask and pray that you would pour out your blessings upon the reading and understanding of it, that we would be as well as hearers of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We go back just a little bit. Because every time I spit when I speak, you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Mark 1, 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. It commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So here is the first reading. Our second reading from Acts chapter 14, starting with the first verse. The same thing occurred in Iconium where Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who testified to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done through them. But the residents of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, the apostles learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued proclaiming the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. I love bluegrass music. And the twangier it is, the better I love it. And sometimes I watch it on what's called RFD TV. I don't know if you get that or not. It's like a rural television network channel. They have cattle auctions and horse shows and <laughs> agriculture shows, but they also have country music shows. And uh, I'll be watching one of those, and if Denise and Emily happen to come in when I'm watching it, they're like, what in the world are you listening to? <laughs> Sounds like somebody is beating a coyote to death with a banjo. <laughs> Sounded pretty bad. But I liked it. And, and one day I was listening to a song, and it started off with a banjo and a fiddle. And I thought, well, that's got to be pretty good. Something right about it. But then the guy started singing, and it took me a minute to realize, wait a minute, he's rapping. And I thought, somebody has mixed bluegrass and hip-hop music. And at that point, I thought, at least for me, there are some things that do not mix. And uh, those just didn't work out too well for me. And in life, it's true that way as well. Some things don't mix. Some things we shouldn't mix. You know, oil and water don't mix. And if you mix ammonia and bleach, you get a deadly gas. And so, uh, you know, just some things that don't mix. It mix. And we see that in both of our scriptures for this morning. In the scripture from the gospel, Jesus has gone to the synagogue and has begun to preach. And as he preaches, the people are amazed at his preaching. They've never heard anything quite like it. He doesn't preach like the scribes who normally preach. Preach When they preach, it's kind of like a book with a thousand footnotes. You know, they have to say something and then back it up with quotes from a hundred different people. You know, if you've ever been in a conversation like that, it can be very annoying. They used to have those at seminary. You know? well, the great philosopher Feuerbach said this, but Paul Tillich said that, and so-and-so said this. And, you, know, you always have to quote somebody else's authority. Well, that's not the way Jesus preached. He preached 
from his own authority. And of course he had great authority as, as God the Son. Jesus is like that. He is compelling. He will draw people to himself if he is revealed to people. And so that's why, you know, we don't have to go out and save people. We can't do that. But what we do is try to draw people to Jesus, and Jesus is compelling in himself to draw people to him. And so it was the way there where people were just amazed at his teaching. But as he was teaching and preaching, suddenly it said that there was a man with an unclean spirit present, which, of course, means he was possessed. You know, in, in the scripture, things are either clean or unclean. Cleans of God, unclean is not. And so it was an evil spirit. And it's usually translated as, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? It was actually an idiom that says, what's this to you and what's this to me? And what it was, what that was, was kind of an arrogant way of saying, you know, why are you here? Why should we give any obedience to you? So it was kind of at first an arrogant statement of, you know, why are you here? But then immediately it goes into fear. God says, are you here to destroy us? You know, they know what their future is. And then it goes on to its knowledge saying, I know who you are. You are Jesus, the Holy One of God. Well, this spirit, of course, uh, Jesus speaks to it. And using the same language that he used to still the storm, you know, where he said, peace be still, he says the same thing here. Peace be still to this evil spirit, shutting it up, and then casting it out of this man. And it came out of him with a convulsion. Again, the people are amazed. You know, what sort of new teaching is this? Not only does he have authority, but he shows the authority by casting out evil spirits that nobody else is able to do anything about. Now, you might want to ask yourself, what, you know, is this evil spirit doing in the synagogue to start with? There are a number, of course, quest answers to that question. You know, kind of like moths are drawn to the flame, Evil is drawn to good, even though it can't stand it, and it won't be it. It is drawn to it and amazed by it. And you can see that in the world sometimes where, you know, if something good is going on, it still it draws things around it that may not be quite so good. Um, you know, I remember a fellow that was a roommate in an apartment I had where you didn't get to choose your roommates. And he was a rough fellow. He used to shoot out his window at a dog, at dog down the block. Uh, the whole house stunk like marijuana because he was smoking it, I guess. And he was a pretty mean and rough fellow. But I would notice when I would come in from class late, and then late at night I would get up and go get a drink of water, he would sit there and watch religious television. You know, he was just like mesmerized by it. And I think eventually he had his life changed. But it was like he was drawn to it, even though he was living exactly the opposite of it. And that's kind of the way it is with, with folks. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you might wonder what the evil was doing in the synagogue. What better place to tear up the synagogue than in the middle of it? And uh, that's also the case, unfortunately, sometimes, you know. Uh, if you're not doing anything for God, you know, Satan can leave you alone. He may not. He'll you know, get a chance to trip you up and he'll do it. But if you start to do something for God, you can certainly count on that point uh, with Satan coming trying to break it up. I think I've told you before about uh, my father had a youth group, and there was a revival of youth where large numbers of youth were coming to church. It was amazing. You know, people would have, have uh, killed to have a youth group like that. But the whole thing ended when they had a party and somebody got a dime-sized piece of taffy on the carpet. And some of the people pitched a fit over a dime-sized piece of taffy on the carpet to the point that that revival ended and the youth kind of broke up and went other places because they realized that the carpet was more important than they were. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how Satan works sometimes. Things start going, and then something petty comes along and tears it up. And, of course, wherever good is, as I said, evil is attracted to it, though it cannot be it, and will be stirred up by it because evil and good do not mix. Uh, Jesus tells the story about the wheat and the tares and how the uh, wheat and the tares look alike and at the end of the harvest they'll be separated. But whenever Jesus is present, evil is stirred because it cannot stand the presence of the Lord. You know, Jesus and darkness do not mix. 
It's like when you have a light turned on, it banishes darkness around it, doesn't it? Wherever there's light, there isn't darkness. And so they do not mix, just as truth and lies do not mix with Jesus. Jesus is truth, and so the lies around us fall away near him. Also, Jesus is true love, and so the fake love that the world has is conditional and based on things. It too falls away in the presence of the Lord. So whenever there's a focus on the Lord, these other things are kind of burned away and banished. But it causes a spiritual conflict because these things don't mix. But what we need to remember is, of course, that Jesus is the final victor. That's what the book of Revelation shows us. Revelation can be scary. You read through it, but it's not meant to be scary. What it's meant to do is show us that no matter how strong evil is, that in the end there will be one victor, and that victor is Jesus Christ. We see the spiritual battle that comes when good and, and evil kind of clash in the book of Acts today from the scripture we read there. We can see what Paul is talking about when he tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You know, our battle is not against people. Sometimes people rub us the wrong way, and sometimes we rub others the wrong way. But our battle isn't against people. Our battle is against spiritual forces that are battling that sometimes use people uh, for its own purposes. So that's always good to remember because it's easy to kind of not like people who may be battling something that's good. But, you know, those people are caught up in the spiritual battle as well. And we can see that in Acts where Paul is preaching in what today would be Europe had come to Europe and begun preaching where darkness had held sway for so long and begins to have some success. You know, they're able to do great signs and wonders or allow the Lord to do them through them. And they're beginning to have large numbers of believers come to them. They're founding churches. And at that point, trouble comes. Just as we talked about previously here. It stirs up the evil around and about. And in some instances with Paul, that evil is local. It is stirred up locally against him and the other believers. And in other instances, it follows him around. You know, in some places in the scripture, he'll go and begin to preach, and some group from somewhere else will follow him there to try to disrupt what he does. And so, uh, whatever it happens, you know, their purpose is to tear down what Paul is building up. There's an old adage that says, one thing is certainly true, you're either on the building team or the wrecking crew. And uh, that's certainly true as well. We need to make sure, you know, those two don't mix. You can't build up and tear down all together. And so we need to make sure we're on the building crew. Well, that's what was happening here. Paul and, and others were building up the church when these others came along and tried to tear it down. We can see that, you know, as in, in real life, spiritual battles, sometimes it may seem as if we are losing. We may seemingly lose a battle here and there, uh, as happened here. Uh, at one point, they had to flee because people were coming to kill them. Now, it certainly would seem to be a loss. They're preaching but have to run for their lives. Uh, sometimes it's like that, two steps forward and then one step back. Uh, it can be slow going sometimes. But sometimes the lost battle uh, may not really be lost. And it can be used by the Lord for his good. If you remember when the church was scattered from Jerusalem, when oppression hit it and it was scattered, uh, you would have thought that was a loss. But they spread the gospel wherever they scattered to and founded churches in the far corners of the Roman Empire where they may never have gone had they not been scattered. And it's the same thing here. They have to flee these places. But if you read on, it says they continued proclaiming the good news wherever they went. And so people were able to hear the gospel who otherwise may not have heard it. So what looks like a defeat can be used by God in the end for good. And in the end, no matter how many defeats it seems like we may go through, in the end, God is the victor. And so that's what we need to remember uh, as we go through our lives as Christians and, and as a church is that first of all, Jesus is the central focus of what we are about. Jesus is the compelling one. So everything that we do should highlight Jesus, should witness to Jesus in a way that brings glory and honor to him. 
And when we do that, when the compelling one begins to draw people, you can expect that that will stir up stuff and probably petty stuff. And it'll end up uh, causing issues uh, because those things don't mix. Remember that we may have a spiritual battle on our hands. You know, it's uh, at that point that uh, you have to battle with all sorts of things in your life. It's like we mentioned when we pray. You can do anything else you set your mind to, but the minute you start to pray, well, your back hurts, your knees hurt, the phone rings, you remember so you got something on the stove, you better get off. You know, everything starts coming in on you. And it's that way with the spiritual battle. You know, it's, it's not going to be you know, some big evil monster standing in front of you, distracting you. It'll be all these other little things that will take you away from what your central focus ought to be. But remember that in Christ Jesus, we have authority. Christ, as we see in the scripture, has authority over all things. And he gives authority to us as believers in his name to do these spiritual battles. As long as we are under his lordship. You know, his name is not a magic charm that we can just throw out there and use. But if he is truly our Lord, then in his name we have authority. Kind of like a policeman. You know, if a 18 wheelers going down a road 80 miles an hour and a cop stands out the road and holds his hand up that truck could squash him flat but the truck will stop because it sees the little badge that the man's wearing it's not the man himself you know he could be a pretty rotten fellow you never know but the badge is a symbol of authority that says you know I've got society standing behind me the laws that we have passed that we've agreed to and so it is that authority that people stop for. It's the same thing with Jesus. In ourselves, we have no power. But in Christ, we have his spiritual authority in his name to work with. And we just got to realize that authority. It's like, uh, this is a true story. I think it may have been from Iowa, where the governor uh, went to a county fair. And it came time to eat, and they were giving out free barbecue chicken. And he was standing in line with everybody else, and he came up and laid put a piece of chicken on his plate. And he was starving because he'd been campaigning all day. And he said, can I have another piece of chicken, please? And she said, I'm sorry. She said, but there's such a long line, we're afraid we're not going to have enough. So maybe just one piece for each person to start with. And he got kind of ugly and hateful. And he said, you know, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. And the lady said, do you know who I am? She goes, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken, so go on down. <laughs> she knew what her authority was. You know, it didn't matter that he was the governor. She had authority over that chicken. And so it's the same way with us. Sometimes uh, we may not think we have authority, but in Christ Jesus, we do. So we need to focus on Jesus, build up uh, God's works around us, remember in our spiritual battles that we may not always win, seemingly. But in the end, in Christ, we will win. But continue to focus on Him. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank You that in the midst of our spiritual battles, You are there. Lord, that Your Word and Your command have authority. Lord, help us not to step outside of Your authority, but to live within it. Lord, help us to live within Your love and grace, to witness to You, to all people, so that they too can come and witness your compelling nature to draw us in and to save us. Lord, help us to serve you in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your hymnals and turn to number 228.